Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our show. Thank you so much for tuning back in. Um, Tan, I really appreciate when you guys actually take the time to come and listen to what we're talking about and to the guests that we bring on. I mean, for the most part, we really do think that the people that we bring on here are have something really worthwhile that is important to share. And today we have a returning guest, David Avocado Wolf, which I'll introduce in just a moment here. But we had a couple of comments in the YouTube channel before around people just kind of sharing with what they liked about certain guests, what they didn't resonate with. I just want people to know it's that's all good. The whole thing is that when we bring a guest on, it's because we feel like there's something there that we've heard them talk about that rang true for us or that resonated and we wanted to have a bigger conversation with them. We don't always agree 100% with any of the guests that we have. Not like most people don't have to agree 100%. But if there's something there that's of value, that's the part you want to pay attention to and then see where you can um, move in that direction. If there's something that a guest talks about about that really resonates with you or speaks to you or inspires you in a certain way, that's what that's where the important part is. If there's other parts that didn't resonate with you, don't worry about it. Then that's not for you. Focus on the stuff that does resonate and that makes you excited for wanting to move forward and, and investigate things a little bit more um, detail. Sometimes some of these guests challenge the way that we have been thinking or have been living in certain ways. I, I think all of us have this sort of you know, imaginary box around how we've been dealing with our life. And sometimes it's fun to have these conversations that kind of blow that box out of the out of the boundaries a little bit. So it gets us to think of things in a totally different way. Now, whether that feels true to you or not, that's up to each individual. And that's totally fine to move in whichever direction you want. I just want you to know, we bring people on here to have conversations and to share things with you. If they're feeling a certain way, there's usually other people that are as well. And sometimes that helps to support them and validate the way they're feeling. But ultimately, find what works. We have lots of different conversations in different places. Um, there's some people you will just find that you resonate with more than others. And if you do, check out their work in more detail. See if that's something that uh, maybe it'll take you on a journey and you'll learn a little bit more from them. Now, before I get into the episode with David Avocado Wolf, so we were talking, we've kind of gotten to know David and we've become friends with him. So we were just ending up having a conversation. I'm going to just have you guys jump right into the middle of our conversation again. But one thing I'm really excited to share with you is that I recently just finished this book that I had been working on. This is the draft of it, uh, Nature Care Solutions. This is called Natural First Aid Kit for the Traveling Family. Now, this is actually a really beautiful book. It's got beautiful pictures and things in this that uh, lots of different information that helps people go through a lot of key areas of first aid and particularly travel first aid. Why I wrote this was when we were away in Mexico, we just found a lot of people weren't too sure what to do when illness arise or when first aid situations happen, particularly with their kids. And so we became a bit of a hub to field some of those questions just because of the background that I have. And so I decided when I came home, I needed to write a book that was going to break this all down. And what I'm actually in the process of doing right now is I am going well beyond this book and I am putting this into a course that I'm going to be offering soon. I'm in the process of kind of putting it together, but it is going to be absolutely kick-ass. I think this is going to be the most complete natural first aid course that I can think about putting together. We're going to cover major areas like tummy troubles, um, cold flu immune support, fever support, um, ear and sinus congestion, bumps, bruises, burns, scrapes, bites, stings, rashes, all of this stuff that at the most part we run into at some point and we want to be prepared ahead of time for when that situation arises. Know what we need to have on hand and how to use it and have the confidence to use it. This is such an important part. I really dedicate this book to all of those amazing parents out there that really want to take an active role in caring for themselves and their kids. And I mean, we know firsthand when something happens when with our kids, particularly when they get ill or when they get injured, it can be a really freaky thing for parents when we don't know what to do. And what I want people to know is that there is so much that we can do before it ever becomes a bigger problem or before we even need to go and look up um, additional medical support. There's so many things. You know, think about even like what our grandparents a lot of times used to be able to manage because they had to, because a lot of times there wasn't access to medical care so easily. So they had to know how to deal with a lot of different things. Well, 
In this course that I am putting together, we are going to go into a ton of different detail and all sorts of things. I'm even going to break down and show you how to do in this course. We will actually do it together. Eight very powerful nebulizer treatments that have been shown to assist in things like upper respiratory tract disease, adult respiratory distress syndrome, respiratory syncytial virus in children, how to alkalinize the body and the lungs, decrease inflammation, have antiviral effects, and so many other health promoting aspects. We get into 10 different poultices that you can make from common things on hand very easily that can you can use for everything from abscesses to skin burns to um, insect bites, all sorts of different things, chest congestion that are really easy to do and learn how to apply them. I'm going to take you through some of the key supplements that you should have in your first aid kit and key things that you need to have at home so that when the time comes, you are ready and prepared and know how to use them. I'm going to put this together, but there's so much stuff packed in this course. I think this is going to end up being an eight-week course that I will likely be doing live with you, and we will be walking through it and fielding questions and taking you through each chapter and showing you how to do all of this stuff. So more on that to come as I put that information together, but I'm really excited about this because I really think this is a course that everybody will need to take at some point so that we know how to manage things for ourselves and our families as much as we can at home. Also know when you need to outsource it to a professional. I will talk about that as well so that we kind of know when, how to be safe and when we need additional support. All right, guys, we're going to jump into the interview with David Avocado. So if you're not sure about David Avocado or who he is, check out our episode 141. He was a part of our detox series. We did an episode with him called Jing Energy, the Color Black and Optimizing Endurance and Longevity. Awesome episode. We covered, covered so much different information on detox and beyond. But I mean, he's probably one of the most well-known nutritionists in the world. He was co-developer of the NutriBullet, best-selling author of a number of different books, including Amazing Grace, Chaga, King of Medicinal Mushrooms, Longevity Now. He's been on a number of different documentaries like Food Matters, um, Hungry for Change, Remedy, Discover the Gift, so many things. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. We really love chatting with David. He's a fun guy to talk to. He's got so much information on so many different topics. So uh, this is a really fun conversation. I'm just going to segue here and you guys can jump right into the middle of it with us. All right, everybody, if you have any questions, let us know. Otherwise, please make sure to like, subscribe, share. That is by far the best way to get this content out and to help keep us keep this going so that we can share this information with as many people as possible. Thanks so much for your support, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So it's lots of fun areas. What I was kind of thinking would be really fun to dive into, particularly with you from your, is maybe start off with just like, what does free choice mean to you? You know, and then let's go through some of the big areas where it's something that we need to kind of talk about a little bit more. So, you know, big industry, um, food and water, healing versus disease, um, you know, the religion of science, like I'm thinking just some of these different areas that we can kind of pull up and and then just have a conversation around as far as because to me, I feel like with free choice, so much of it requires knowing certain information to a point to be able to make a I mean, that's the basis of informed consent. So if that's not there, then are your decisions and choices really that free? Or what do you need to know to then make more of an informed choice around stuff? And we can kind of look at maybe some of those areas where, um, you know, it might not be so informed because there's information that's just not available to you or that you've withheld. been taken away, withheld. That sounds fantastic. I mean, I immediately went to public schools, right? Like, Public schools don't teach you anything that you actually need to know to make an informed choice about anything. Yeah. The whole thing is just a complete waste of time. And so I'm seeing a really cool trend of homeschooling, which is really getting us back to like, hey, actually, let's teach this child about real choices so that they can make an informed choice, right? And in every area of their life. So it really comes down to the government indoctrination centers, which is about giving, it's basically about wasting time. You're just time wasting so that eventually the kid, if they're going to get sane at all or actually create freedom at all, they have to unlearn what's been, they've been indoctrinated with for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, 18 years, whatever it is. So that, that to me is really one of the core pieces. Now, some people are very, are born very lucky. And uh, I have a cousin who was like this and 
when I was a kid growing up, he had all these books. And I mean, when I say books, I mean two layers of books on bookshelves. Like I'd go through one layer of books and then there was another layer behind it. And I was always like, who read all these books? Like how, like where, what is going on in this house? And then I eventually found out that he was a berserk reader and he'd been a reader since he was about two or three years old. Mm -hmm. And by the time he was 10 years old, he'd read tens of thousands of books. I mean, that's not an exaggeration. And he ended up going to MIT at the, no, sorry, University of Chicago at the age of 14. And now is in one of the ivory towers here in Houston um, at the top of, he's the top, he's the head uh, account, he's the, he's the te- head lawyer for Apple computer in Houston and one of the top lawyers in the country. And, you know, it's just what, what created it was the reading. So he was his own like homeschooling. Mm. And then you can imagine all the choice that that gives you, the breadth of knowledge that that can give you. And that's really, if I can get a kid onto that, like we we have this one kid we've been hanging out with a lot lately who's really into Egypt and he loves the mummies and the Egyptian monuments and the Sphinx and everything. So we're going all the way to just go deeper, all the way in, go, you know, you're obviously a reincarnated Egyptian all the way. Nice. And it's really cool, right? That's That's where real education is happening which then creates, it actually gives fruit to real choice. Awesome. That gets me so excited hearing you speak uh, of that because that's totally in line with what we're doing with our kids. It's like we're, um, we're tuned in to where they are and, you know, we have three kids and they all have very different interests. And it's like, if we are, you know, initially when we thought, okay, we need to homeschool because there's no way we're sending our kids to, those indoctrination centers, those prog- programming um, buildings. Um, we we decided to homeschool and I thought it would be really hard. <laughs> and really <laughs> when you show up with your kids day after day, they will tell you, they will communicate with you what they are ready for and what they want you to bring to them. It's actually not as hard as we thought. And then we're just doing that. We're supporting them on their journey by simply listening deeply to where their interests are. Like one of my girls, she loves horseback riding. She like speaks their language. She's in her element. She lights up. She's filled with so much confidence when she's with the horse, guiding the horse, um, you know, cleaning after the horse. And it's teaching her so many skills on a regular basis. And that's her thing. Whereas our youngest one can't stand it. Like she gets all stuffy and we've, we've taken her to horse camp and horse lessons a few times and she comes out of there and she's just not happy. So then it's like, okay, that's great. Sophie, you go, Seiji, we'll find something else for you. She's into singing Sage. She has a big voice, but it's like, they clearly communicate with us what it is that they're interested in. And our job as parents is simply to be open um, rather than thinking, well, you know, probably similar to your upbringing with with the Persian background, but it's like, well, if you're not going to become a lawyer, a doctor, or uh, an accountant, then it's it's a life missed out. <laughs> so if, if we kind of drop the way that we feel um, that kids need to be in order to be successful, then we can actually be present and show up for them on a day-to-day basis and just guide them. And then they can be, you know, the best gardener, ever because they're in their element or the best nutritionist or whatever it is that they choose to ultimately do we feel like that's their spirit calling them forth so we just support them in that process it it was was funny it was funny david that when she was at horse camp and we got at the time she was four and um, i remember breaking up and she comes out and this is the one that wasn't such a fan of horse camp and uh, she comes out she's like daddy this was the best horse camp day ever. I'm like, oh my gosh, honey, what'd you guys get to do? What was so awesome? She's like, we did a barn dance. (laughs) (laughs) So it was the fact that she got to dance and sing and that was what made it the best day ever for her. So which is totally her, right? Yeah, that's definitely her thing. But you're right. It's like, we got to support these youngsters who are going to be creating our future in the way that it means something. Because clearly we're realizing now that the way in which we were schooled is is actually schooling us out of the gifts that we actually came into this world to share and um you know people like yourself 
how did you go about schooling? Because you're definitely thinking out of the box. I, I was born as one of those kids. I never believed anything that they told me. To my detriment in many cases, too, I would say. But I'm still like that. It's That's why, like, I just never believed anything that they told me. I, I never, I, I would regurgitate it to pass the test or whatever, but I never actually believed it. And so I'm a black sheep of the family in that way. And so over, you know, there, and there's ways that that works in your favor and there's ways that work that works against you. Um, so if somebody teaches me like for a long time, they'd be like, Hey, this is the simplest way to fix a carburetor or that I'd never believe them. And I'd be like, there's gotta be another way, which was to my detriment for sure. <laughs> But, you know, that's that's the kind of person that I am. And so, if you know, some people are just born that way because that's just the way that that's how the system gets flipped over. Um, if everyone is born the same and just believed everything they were told, then we'd all be in it. We'd be really in trouble at this point. Um, fortunately, we're not really in trouble. We're actually in a really awesome awakening process. My kind of take on this legion of homeschooled kids is that they're going to save us because those, let's just say in North America, let's say there's 10 million of them. I suspect there's around 10 million of them in North America. That that group is actually going to carry the whole rest of the group. They're going to carry everybody else. And, and we're going to see a, a really interesting transformation in, in leadership and society um, because of them. And I'm really excited about it. I mean, I'm just, I'm excited about everything that's happening right now because a lot of what's going on right now is but what I've been trying to tell people since I, I can remember. It's like, the money system is fake and it's it's you can't fix it because it's a usury system. We need to get off the usury system completely. We need to actually get into like a competitive environment of currencies. Like I like that about the cryptocurrencies. You have a competitive environment of currencies so that the best one wins. I mean, that's the free market. And you can see how these systems that are in place are all monopolized by people who are, who are against the free market, which is really interesting, right? All these governments, they're all against the free market. They want their, their party and that their way or the highway. That's the way it's going to be. Medicine, all their way or the highway. There's no freedom. There's no free market at all. They want to get rid of it. And so this is just, it's a cool discovery that this communism or collectivism or socialism or whatever you want to call it, is finally rearing its ugly head to the point where people are going, my God, I better wake up quick. Mm -hmm. And what an awesome moment, because for those of us who've been at this a long time, we've been waiting for this moment. In a lot of ways, COVID-19 is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely the big shakeup. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely. I think you're shaking lots. And well, and even when you were talking about school, I, I think about it like with the homeschooling, it's like, you know, even, even like at different times, things just shift. It's like, what even even if there are certain parts of that that might have worked at a certain point for certain generations, inevitably things change. And if the system's not really changing, you're going to keep doing the same thing that you have done. Or what's cool right now is like for for parents that aren't liking what's going on in the in the current system and they want something different, these new branches are opening up to do things differently. And and inevitably you're going to raise children that are going to be thinking differently than how we've been thinking so it's kind of neat that way because it's like you know we were talking about this the other day it's like yeah i mean my thoughts like with the school system I mean, a lot of times people get in and want to like then fight back and forth with the system and you got to change this and you got to change that and my thoughts are like if you're really being called to do that and that really feels like that's that's what you're here to do is to, to put up a fight with that then go for it my feeling was like that's fine. That's no longer in residence. I want to find what is now and then just move in that direction. And so we did. And then we, you know, all this stuff opened up to have this really beautiful four school outside of the, of the system set up for our kids to be able to enjoy. And I mean, they, they love it. Like, like seriously, David, we go to pick them up and they're, they're upset that they have to leave. They're asking us if they can go to school on Saturday. Um, I mean, they just love it. There's animals there. There's, there's gardening involved in it. There's nature walks all over the place. I mean, it's all, it's a really beautiful place for them to be. But part of that was also then just making a decision that if it's really not working and you're really fighting all the time, I mean, if, unless, if that's not resonating with you to be in that fight, then look for another option. Like, you know, cut chains with it and, and move into something else. Because I totally agree. I think these kids that are doing this are going to inherently think differently because they're in a very different system. And we talked about this earlier around what is the, you know, you have to kind of evaluate what is most important for you that you want your children to embrace in a quote unquote schooling kind of a system. And for us, the very first thing was an incredibly strong sense of self. That, that was it. So it's like, how do you do that? Put them back in nature. 
to me, that's how you're going to connect back to that innate sense of self. And then from there, they're going to be able to navigate all of the stuff that comes to them, you know, and, and first and foremost, like, gosh, like, I don't want them being exposed to so much confusion around things is particularly now there's so much confusion in the, in the systems that I want them out. I want them to know who they are, get very solid in that. So that then when this, they bump up against this stuff, then great. They're, they're going to be able to address it from a place of knowing who they are rather than being influenced that maybe they're supposed to be something different, you know, or at least they'll be able to navigate that. I think a lot better. Well said, well said. Well, what you're doing is you're, you're creating what I think, Rudolf Steiner was really trying to get people to orient around, which is an environment that actually creates new ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, that was that was really the core of Rudolf Steiner's whole thing about our epoch of time, you know, our post Atlantean or post Diluvian world that we're in right now is to get to original ideas. Almost everybody's ideas are the same. That's really true. And this uh, ability to create a new idea is really an incredible it's a it's a triumph for a human being just think of how many people are trying to stop new ideas from happening it's really it, it, the um, the array of forces to stop innovative thinking is vast and incredibly overwhelming and so once you but once you committed to new ideas once you're actually committed to innovation then not, not all those forces are pushed away because you actually develop a sense of self. Um, you've developed, actually, that's the, really the true meaning of ego, right? You're, and that's a very important thing to develop, right? Most people are actually just doing what everybody else is doing, which means they have no ego. They haven't individuated themselves, right? We always have ego as a bad connotation, but it, ego is individuation, which we want individuation. We don't want people to be just a herd. They're just, you know, bad and, you know, they're going to do what everybody else does, which, you know, St Steiner said that's a, that's a breakdown in eye formation or ego formation. One of the key tenets of a human being, one of the four major tenets of a human being that differentiates you by, by the way, from all the animals, right? The animals have a very difficult time developing an individual personality. They can, if they're around humans for a while and, you know, they, they figure out like, okay, you know, they, this human wants this and this human wants that. I can get food if I do this. And they start to individuate. And that's what makes them so interesting. And that's what makes domesticated animals so interesting. But, you know, barring that, very strong forces want everybody thinking the same. Yeah. Well, the only way you're going to get new ideas is by being more of your unique self and bringing that into the world. That That's really it. Because everybody's, you know, so like Rudolf Steiner, I think even Maria Montessori talked about that, uh, that, uh, oh, how did she call it? Um, it was like the, the cosmic spark or something along those lines. That's ultimately the job of the school system is to bring that out, right? Same sort of idea. Um, mind you, I, I don't, I think it's seldom that you find the schools that still apply so so much to those original teachings they're not quite the same anymore they've been they've become regulated i remember i had my son in waldorf 14 years ago and we revisited the school and he attended waldorf for three years before um, i was no longer at that time able to afford to send him but we revisited the waldorf option probably four or five years ago and we saw that after it's it being regulated, it was no longer the same. It lost its essence. Yeah, Interesting. It's, it's it's hard not to when when I mean because the system's a, a system, so it's like you're going to try and take pieces and and apply it within a certain system. So even these great ideas, sometimes you know the system might want to take some of those and go, oh, you know, nature school. There's aspects of this that sound really good and kind of work, but let's put it within this still. 90% of what the system is. So if that <laughs> system is not great, whatever, whatever yeah. that system is. I mean, then, then it's like, the, you know, you're trying to find a, a whole new way of doing things. So it's part of this, this process that I think is just going on right now. We're seeing it in lots. I, I think it's stirred up a lot of these areas. And this is why we're having this conversation even around free choice, because I think the idea around free choice is it's like when we're really making those choices that, that come from deeper inside, um, and we're, we're understanding enough of the information to be able to make an informed decision around things, then we will start to create 
the world anew. We'll we'll put something new into the world and see what's going to, I mean, I'm excited to see what's going to even show up. I mean, it's, we're moving into this new uncharted territory. So where would be some of the areas, David, that maybe we need to shine a bit more of a light on? Like, I mean, there's lots of them, but I'm thinking things like even, even like food, water, um, what would people need to know around that area that would help them be able to make even better choices on what they're choosing from? I mean, this well, is an area you've spent half your life with. So there's there's something I've been onto lately. I'm going to show you some cool stuff here, that, which is the logic of your local environment. And so I want to show you something. My friend Dandelion just brought this over. I'm going to show you this real quick. This has been. Okay, let's make grab this. Uh, here we go. This has been a real fun one this week. And I've been super, super excited about this particular thing. And it's just getting into the logic of your ecosystem and what's around you. And uh, so I'm going to show you something here that I, I just find to be one of the most fascinating things ever, which is the Osage orange or the horse apple. That's oh, these wow. Right now, the, these fruits right here are not, they have an awesome, they have a smell and an aroma that's just friendly and just delightful and magical, but they're not, it's like a quince. It's not a fruit you eat. But it is a fruit of value and has properties that are not edible properties. They're just they're they're like good luck charms. Mm -hmm. They are inspirational and they bring new ideas and they're innovative. They also keep insects out of your closet. They keep spiders and moss and insects out of your closet. So people put these all inside their house in the corners. They put them in their up top top shelf in their closet, and they they have this energy that they exude now the tree itself is the tree that the local comanche in the region where i live right now the comanche that they made their bows out of mm -hmm. and so is it it's very resistant to rot if every tree in this environment it's the most resistant to rot you'd have to go all the way into appalachia to the rabinia pseudo acacia to the black locust tree to get a tree that's of equivalent magic um so in the entire region here this particular plant right here this tree was narrowed down until just about 250 years ago to a region that we know as the Comanche territory of Texas only. This is Texas's most illustrious plant, actually, that it's gift to the world. And then from there, people start realizing this makes a great, around the 1840s, they started realizing this makes a great hedge. It's like barbed wire. You can't get through it. It's thorny. There's no way. If you mm -hmm. chop this thing, and no, nothing's getting through it. And they started using it as a hedge plant. And still today, on the edges of farms and old roads and old old abandoned meadows you'll see these on the corners still growing and they they speak of a of a different age in the earth's history and they speak of a different type of wood a very dense hardwood very good for burning very good for carving excellent it's still the number one choice for bows in the world of a wood still number one choice mm -hmm. and you, you know we could go on about and it's protection too it's this thing is a it's a it, you having these all around this is why i told dan i was like dude you got some going off bring me a whole bunch. So he did. He just brought me a whole bunch down from where he's at. And look at these guys. I mean, <laughs> and it, it's not an apple. It's not in the malice family and it's not an orange. It's not a citrus. It's a mulberry family yeah, it's with yeah. your relative. It's in the mulberry family, which also is distantly related to the artocarpus, which is the bread fruit and bread nut. And also the, um, the, the family, that produces like petali and all these amazing tropical super fruits. It's also distantly related to that, but again, not an edible thing, just a magical thing, but a fruit nonetheless. And uh, that's the kind of thing that I want to get people into is what is right out in your front door. What are you missing? That's right in front of you. What's going on and what's the tree in front of your house doing. I did a whole sp uh, spiel recently on, the tree in front of my house in Ontario, actually, right in front of the door. I was always like, I mean, the squirrels brutalize that tree. And I was like, why this tree? Like, can they leave my tree right in front of my door alone? It, like, there's plenty of trees in the forest. Until one day I realized that's the tree that has the lowest tannic acids in the oak and the acorns. Hmm. And the squirrels know that. So they'll come and they'll chew whole pieces of the tree off, drop the acorns to the ground, and then they'll go they'll eat those. And I was like, wait a second. They're not getting those acorns. I'm getting those acorns because those are the best to eat. And so I started going, oh, yeah, you go, yeah, get bring those things down for me. And we're going to collect them all. We're going to make our own acorn bread and our own acorn everything. And that just turned out to be one of those insights of like, 
nature's constantly working for you. It's constantly trying to get a message to you. It's trying, it constantly trying to improve your situation. We just have to listen to what is obvious and right directly in front of us with innocent perception. We have to, we have to innocently perceive it so that we can partake in the magic. You know, this, um, this is total amazement right here. What's going on with this. I, I, I have to say, and to me, you know, when I, Oh, there was a little insect on there. What is that thing? Oh, it was like a little roly poly thing. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a roly poly. Okay. Let's see if I can get it. Come on. <laughs> this is so beautiful, uh, David, what you're speaking of. Cause I feel like, you know, in the face of these governmental bodies in our big brother and our faith and trust in, in these institutions that are now crumbling before our very eyes, we're really being called home. We're really being called to check in with and tune into nature, uh, the trees, the forests, the water, the animals around us, the plants that we're surrounded by, um, and really tune into that frequency and those offerings because it is through that level of being in the world that we're, we're truly being supported and held. Okay, so you know, you guys have done enough research into the occult to know that what we're really up against, and, and I think most people are going to realize this either now or that they're coming to the realization or they will realize it soon, that we're really up against black magic, that we're up against black magicians. And so they're using astrology, they're using predictive programming, they're using all kinds of spells, they're using all kinds of um, sacred geometry, all kinds of things that are magical. Why are they doing that? How come they're not using science, right? Why aren't they using science? So isn't this a scientific world? And the reason they don't use science is because this is a magical world. And so white magic or real magic or natural magic is the cure to the black magic. The science and the scientism is trying to drive you off course to get you onto something that doesn't make sense. Right. That's it's not a scientific mechanical world of Newtonianism or Darwinism. We're not beating each other over the head with clubs or with bones. And we're not apes that suddenly figured out how to run around. I mean, this stuff is it's it's there. That is a spell that they cast on us and they used Holly weird to cast it on us. And it's that once you realize that you go, oh, we're in a magical reality. That's the reality that we're in. That's where this stuff comes in. And you realize that this, this is a magical object. And there are many magical objects all around us at all times. Just yesterday, I, was, I went across a friend of mine. He's been dealing with some health troubles. And he stopped in here and he just wanted to get kind of get away from home, change his, change his environment. And we walked across the street because the house across the street is for sale. And I was wandering around the backyard and I was like, oh, check out this old holly. So we have two wild hollies that grow in this environment here. One of them is the Yaupon holly, which is the Ilex of the north it's the the yerba mate of the north which is vastly superior to yerba mate in my opinion mm. tastes better has a better effect it's magical it grows everywhere around here but there's another holly that grows around here like hollywood mm. and you should have seen this holly that i found in the forest yesterday i mean i got this you see right here right in front of it was this feather that was a blue jay feather see that right there and that was there, and, and it had this vine wrapped around it, and it was an old growth holly, Hollywood, the magical stick. And I was like, you just look at that tree, and you're like, that thing is totally magical. Like, what is going on with that tree? We're so brainwashed by the scientism that we're not able to see the magic of a tree, especially a tree that we know for sure has magical powers. Hollywood. I mean, how much more obvious does it have to be? Mm -hmm. This is the insanity. And so I'm just bringing people to that all the time. Brett, like, come back to your senses. Come back to reality. Here we are. I and by it. the way, I'm going to get a branch off that tree because that tree is really <laughs> Make a staff from that or something. I'm i got to so take some pictures of it. I'm so uh, glad you brought that up because we were, we were hoping. And, you know, our um, intention in sharing this information is so that people become aware because this is the time of awareness. 
we are stepping into it right now. So with all this immense light coming in that is gifting us with awareness, all these shadows are going to come to the surface for us to be able to see it all very clearly. And there is no fear, like there should be no fear. We should just stand very strong in on our ground on this beautiful earth and collectively just, you know, declare no fear as we see every bit of the detail. And then from that point through our full knowing and understanding and realignment with what's absolutely true, um, then we make different choices moving forward. So I'm so glad you even brought up this this topic of magic because it's been brought up. Sean Stone yeah, spoke we, of it. We talked about it's it's funny because we didn't we didn't try to bring it up. We were curious to see what was going to show up around it. And it's come up in several of the different interviews. So Sean Stone talked about it and I think Laurel, the, Erica. Laurel Erica talked about it. Um, Goldman's. I think the Goldman's even talked about it. It's come up in several ways in different aspects and like you know, it's one of these things where if people aren't familiar with it, it's, it's it's not this kind of hocus pocus magic. It's like it's really the essence of manifestation. It it really is. And and it and it ties much more into your focus and your awareness and what you're in resonance with and intention. And, and intention. And there's a lot of these type of things that you know are okay when people want to talk about manifestation but then they kind of get weirded out by it when you try and explain it from a concept of magic but it's like it, it really is and when you were talking about science you know i was um i was just watching uh, I, I don't even know who it was that was talking but it was this older fellow and and he was i don't know if he was like an archaeologist or anthropologist or something along those lines but he was basically just talking about people that have gone to school for so long and i'm not poo-pooing going to school for a long time i think if that's your thing i mean I, I went to school for a long time too part of that is you know in the system sometimes that's what you do to move to where you want to go but what his thing was that a lot of the kids coming out of school now especially if they've been in longer and longer they come out and it's like they don't believe anything unless they see a peer-reviewed double-blind placebo-controlled study for it and they said they've actually lost the essence of what quote unquote, science was supposed to be, which was observation. It's like they've lost the ability to just observe. And so what you're kind of talking about is, in a lot of ways, I think, trying to rekindle that skill of observation. And and so it makes you have to slow down, get out of your head a little bit more, and just be aware of what's right in front of you, um, whether that's what's right in front of you from a natural perspective. Like, I mean, here, David, where we are, it's like, you know, I'm looking around and thinking about that with the different plants all around. It's like, we are surrounded by pine. And I don't think that's any surprise that there's so much pine here because I think that's a really powerful medicine. And, and it's such a giving tree. I mean, it gives so much. Like there's so many aspects of that that are beneficial, whether it's the pine pollen or the pine needles or the pycnogenol from the bark or using it for wood. I mean, build houses. I mean, it's, it's giving for everything. I've also seen a ton of hawthorn berry all over the place here. Not surprised at that, given the amount of cardiovascular stuff that we're seeing around too. I mean, I feel like it's it's there to kind of just sort of provide information, help us kind of look at it, and then and then maybe even just contemplate a little bit around what does that mean? Because because there's there's these synchronicities that show up, and to question them, I think just opens it up, us up to thinking of things from another another way and letting new information come in and then that ultimately helps us make more choices it's like this this intuitive sort of dynamic rather than such an intellectual linear dynamic with the world yeah and i don't think it's so much thinking it's more intuiting it's more just being receptive and open and then you get these insights and inclinations that's what i mean there's like the switch it's like having more of an intuitive relationship with the world as opposed to a a linear rational thinking relationship with the world. There might be a place for that in certain frequencies, but like when we talked to RJ Spina, I asked him, is there any place for that? He goes, no, he goes, not, not in the, only in the lower frequencies. In the lower frequencies, that is the tool to get the job done. When you move into higher frequencies, you access information in a different way, in a non-linear, multi-dimensional way that's usually more intuitive based. And that's actually a more reliable information, but it's not so accessible down here. Down here, that is the tool for the job. Moving into a different place and a relationship with the world, we access different information. So I'm really curious about what that other information that we have access to, what how that informs our life. 
one of the things that I stumbled into when I was very young and I'm very fortunate to have had these experiences and, and did have made them a part of my life. And they cured me of a lot of the angst and troubles of our civilization is the psychedelic experience, the psychedelic experience. And I was lucky I was introduced into it in the right way and in natural settings with the right people. It just started to didn't initially do it, but it started to obliterate the scientism worldview. You're a naked ape spinning on a ball on a planet in the middle of nowhere with no meaning. You know, it's just complete gobbledygook nonsense. It really is. It obliterates that. And so it heals you of that. And I think that's why the psychedelic experience is with us now on, on the level that it's at. I mean, there's more people microdosing now than ever in history by far. I mean, I was just talking to a friend of mine last night from Greece and she's like, everyone's microdosing around here. I'm like, in Greece? Like, what? I mean, it was just, I was like, what's going on? It's a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just Silicon Valley. It's everywhere. Because more and more people want to be healed of their scientism, of their materialism, of their materialistic viewpoint. They sense there's a magical reality out there. They're trying to get to it. Now, raw foods, superfoods, fasting really tunes you into it quick. And, and that's really beautiful, too, because you have to, you're forced to derive energy from other things you it's not going to be coming from just like some materialistic food it's like it comes from music it comes from a walk in nature it comes from the breeze it comes from the the flow of of leaves from the trees and in, in the autumn it, it flows from all those things and many other things and so the the healing occurs through all those methods all happening at once and brings a new worldview in that is it's not really well described in any of the books we're normally exposed to, but is well described in the psychedelic books that are out there. For example, you know, people go to the jungle, drink ayahuasca. They have a totally different understanding of the jungle. A friend of mine, the same woman from Greece, who was telling me last night, she said that she um, one time was drinking ayahuasca in a, a little village in Brazil. And she went out to the forest and there, this tree came alive and spoke to her for like a half hour. And you know, I was like, wow, what, you know, what kind of tree was it? She's like, I don't know what kind of tree it was, but maybe I could find out. And th those types of things that are seemingly fantasy are actually more and more considered reality because this idea of like, Hey, how did ayahuasca get figured out? You got 400,000 plants. How did they take those two and put them together and figure out how that effect? Somehow the information must've been downloaded just as you were saying, it's high frequency information. It's coming in from many different directions at once. And it's just download. And you just know that ability to just know about plants and trees and just have that communion is automatic for a human being. Once you're cured of scientism, um, once, once you're cured of giving your power away, it's just automatic. You, you're automatically in communion with your environment. You're automatically in commun communion with the animals in your environment. We had just yesterday, right? A friend of mine, that friend who was, who was he's dealing with some health troubles. When he came into the driveway, right at, right at that time of the day, there was a huge stag right in right in our driveway. And he came right to it and full antlers, the whole thing. And he's like, dude, this thing was like 350 pounds. It was massive. And it was right next to me. And I was like, geez, I walk up and down that driveway at that hour all the time, never even noticed. They could have been, it could have been standing right there and just waiting for me to pass because there's a little there's a spot in the back of this property that they go through the deer and there's a spot in the front and they basically leave everything else alone they don't really come in the yard that much it's really interesting they've kind of learned to just pa pass through and i was like wow right there at all times you know the deer the porcupines the um we have armadillos down here they're super mm -hmm. cool the armadillos uh -huh. and all the other little creatures that the opossums we have opossums here raccoons all they're, they're all they're in a communion of everything that's happening around here. It's fascinating to see how they interact with each other, how they come in the yard, what they like to do, what they like to mess around with, what they don't mess with. It's that's all part of that. Just it's automatic. Once you get out of the television or whatever, the, the entertainment industry, the scientism, you know, whatever you want to call all that stuff. Yeah. Well, even, even be paying attention. I mean, it's a part of like what's showing up in front of you. Uh, we were here and it's like, there's, we're on Vancouver Island. There's lots of different animals that come up around here. Mm -hmm. But lately, what was really cool is, you know, we had a, a big um, great horn owl pop down at nighttime right in front of the tree. And the, the like right of, in front of our window, there's this large tree growing and the big horned owl 
flew right out and flew right in. And as soon as he sat down on the branch, the whole tree just shook. It was so magical. So we're all out there with the kids, like watch, looking at it and looking at it with binoculars and stuff. And then it takes off. And, and then there's, so stuff like that, I think is kind of neat when, when some of these animals show up to you, investigate it. To, to me, that's a part of this intuition and what messages are coming up. Be curious about it. So, you know, Dr. Christiane Northrup had recommended a book to us, um, Animal Speaks. And so we check it up and we're kind of reading about that. And the and to all the parents out there, we actually do this with our kids. So we get totally stoked and excited and then bring out the book and open up the pages. And like we, along with the kids, are just as excited yeah. and inspired by everything that we see around us. And it us. gets them mm -hmm. noticing stuff like that. They, they sort of recognize that that's something, there's something to that. Um, but it was kind of neat because we see that and we sort of learned that actually the the reciprocal to that, but the daytime version is the red-tailed hawk. And we've had a red-tailed hawk that's been flying around here as well. So it's kind of neat to just see and then then like read about it and, and see what maybe message those animals are related to and then see how that applies to your life. You know, just be curious about it. It it's actually makes things... <clears throat> so much more interesting and and fun you know your life becomes kind of fun and it's a little more spontaneous you know and, and you kind of ebb and flow with things as it's being presented to you because each time stuff like that comes up your own personal instructions present with new information and see where that takes you it's it makes life really exciting and different and you know you're out of this structured box all the time i get sometimes you gotta have some structure to kind of live by it with certain things but it adds a lot of flavors in, into living, I think. I, I agree with that. That was well said. You know, there's this amazing book called Love Without End, Jesus Speaks, worth your read. It's by Glenda Green. She's the author, amazing woman, absolutely incredible woman. And one of the things she talks about that in that book is the, is the balance between love and structure. And, you know, it's dynamic. And eventually what you end up with is the structures, eventually the love goes out, goes somewhere else, and the structure remains. And, uh, and then that, you know, then what happens with those structures and how, that's where the authoritarianism arises out of. And it's this, this dynamic that's constant throughout all history of love and structure. Like, for example, Temple University is one of the great universities, but it was built just, you know, strictly from just the love of the founder. He just loved being able to educate these kids. And, you know, it was just, you could see the passion. Is that how it is today? I doubt it. Is that how any university is today? I doubt it. You, you, almost all that that love is gone and it's gone somewhere else and so we're always trying to track that and stay on that and that's the surfing of life that's you know that's trying to stay in your passion stay in in your your glory stay in the thing that keeps you inspired and that's what keeps me going after hunting this stuff down is like where's this leading to well the next thing is is i'm going to be th this all all this stuff's getting planted right in the back here and all actually get planted all over this property and it'll all spring up next year and so this place by the time I'm done with this place, this is my friend's house, a Vietnam War veteran, dessert guy, huh. petroleum engineer. And he's told me crazy stuff about that, by the way. Like, I was like, is it true that old wells fill up? And he's like, yes. What fills them up? The source rock. So if there's a way from the source rock to get to the well, it will refill up. What, what's the source rock? Oh, that's the rock that creates the petroleum. So there's a rock that creates the petroleum. Yes. So you see it, You see where that goes? So, you know, for this place, for him, I want to leave this place. You know, this is, it's, it, I'm living here now. Uh, by the time I'm done with this place, this place is going to be epic, no matter who comes in here, because mm -hmm. I've been, you know, that's the mark I'm going to leave. Like, you know, people are like, why do you do so much work? You don't even own that house. It's like, because this is where I'm living right now. And I will leave my mark on this land and it will, the impact will be felt. I don't need to own the place. Any place that I'm working on is going to be improved because I'm there. That's wow. how we have to start thinking about it. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's amazing to me how many people say that to me. They're like, you don't own the place. Why would you do that? I was like, what universe are you in? Where, like, what is that? Yeah. Well, it's that, it's that, it's that same it. idea of separatism that we, that we still lack we, and we, separatism. We still, yeah. Lack and separatism. It's like when those two things are there, you know, then you, then you understand why that sort of thought process comes up. If you, if you don't think of things as being so separate and lack, then you're, you're always kind of putting yourself into it because ultimately everything you put into it is, is all part of you anyways. So uh, it changes everything in the way that you interact with the world because- um, It's like our, our friend RJ said, he, he said your task, and he, he really mm -hmm. clarified this for me and made it really simple that 
I feel like a big load has lifted off my my shoulders. He said, your task is to simply imbue this realm with your high frequency. So how is it that I'm able to step into the best version of myself? And my job is simply just to, you know, sprinkle be. that around, be yeah. in my essence. And um, and everyone and everything around me will benefit from that. And that that is all. That was good. <laughs> I like that. That's it, right? Raise the vibration and just and just go all in and just go for it. And that's such a fun expedition. It really is. There's so much there. And I, you know, I tune in on the plant world. Other people are more tuned in on the animal world. There's a world that's surrounding us at all times, including even the the created world, the human created world, that's always informing us. It's always providing us all kinds of information. There's the geological world that's always providing us all kinds of information, all kinds of magic that's going on. And that's always immediately right around us. So it's all right there. So if I see an 1111, that's a human created phenomenon, but it's not, it's on a hypersynchronicity note. So it's just like, you know, a bass harmonic or something, if you're a musician or, you know, some kind of a, a paradiddle diddle or something, if you're a drummer, you know, there's always, there's something that's always where the magical world bleeds on through that's right immediately around us all the time, even in our office environment, anything. And by the way, these things are going to be right here with me in my office environment, right here, all around. I'm super excited to actually have them just right here so I can play with them all day. What a neat thing. What a, what an amazing deal. And that that orientation also makes it a lot easier to find your food. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier to find your water. Water, spring water is all around. It's like around you at all times. It, there, it makes it a lot easier to understand the, the logic of your environment, like what's here. So, for example, right here in front of this house, there is a pine tree. Okay. And that pine tree is producing that bioidentical testosterone. It's right here, actually. I haven't even showed you guys this yet. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is an experiment we've been doing that's really fascinating. This is, our, this is the pine pollen from the region. And it's Pinus Tata, or the Loblolly Pine, which is the dominant pine in the South, and one of the dominant pines in the world and in North America. And you can see the pine pond right here. You can see that. It's a little bit caked together because it's got glycerin in it. But you can see the glycerin at the bottom. Cool. This, so this is the bioidentical testosterone from, say, that tree right there. Right below it is the chaste berry, or vitex berry, which is bioidentical progesterone. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a coincidence? People are still thinking it's a coincidence. I, it, that boggles my mind. Like, what, what kind of evidence am I going to have to show people? <laughs> and, and then then right growing with it. Here's another thing. It's just nuts. Growing with it is the saw palmetto, which is the berry of which is the dominant medicine in the world for prostate. They all grow together right here. Everywhere you look. It's just, I, it boggles my mind. It just, can people really still think that's a coincidence? And every ecosystem has that logic. So all you have to do is uncode your ecosystem and you just go, oh, look, there's that for this. Oh, there's that for that. And even in, what let's, let's just say the Maroons and from Suriname. So you have a race of people in Suriname that were there, the Native American people. Then you had the white people who came over. Then you had the slaves. Two or 300 years ago, the slaves were like, screw this, we're not doing this. And they just split. They just like took off into the jungle. Today, those people called the Maroons have a more dynamic, more broad, more vast understanding of the, of the herbs and the fauna and the medicines of their ecosystem than the native people do hmm. in the same ecosystem. Hmm. Just think about that. So really, you have three races of people there. You have the white people, you have the Maroons, and you have the native people. They still are all living in that ecosystem. They all have three different completely ways of living out of that same ecosystem. Hmm. So there can be many types of logic out of the same ecosystem. That's a stunning revelation. It just depends on your perspective. Hmm. I've seen many plants, um, psychoactive plants. Like if you're in Peru, everybody chews coca in Peru. But I know from my books on psychedelic plants that the Incan royalty smoked it. I've talked to every shaman in the entire nation of Peru. Everyone. I've gone through up and down, up and on the coast, into the mountains, everywhere. Anybody know anybody who smokes coca? Not one person. Zero. Because the perspective of the current civilization that's there has a certain way of interacting with that plant. And if that perspective and those ideas change and that race changes, suddenly it's a totally different idea how to interact with that plant. 
and you can see this in so many different contexts with you know the way that tobacco is used the way that it, cannabis is used the way all of them it really depends on the consciousness that's interfacing with it mm. yeah these plants it will ultimately like an apple tree an apple tree has got so many properties that are never talked about ever like the root bark of an apple tree is an insanely powerful heart medicine mm. never used how many people grow apple trees would never even think about scraping the root bark, never even heard of it, no idea even what I'm talking about. And we could go on like this at it just infinitely. But I would suggest, and I, my suspicion is that the great fruit trees of the world are really, really deep medicines in the sense that there's a lot there that's not being used. There's a lot there that could be utilized. If we just focused on just an apple or just a, a a plum, or we just focused on just a pear. Pears are really powerful anti-parasite. You, know, you drink pear juice for a month, you can get worms out. I mean, it's that level. Mm. Wow, David, does that tie in with the um, the fruit tree planting foundation that you've created? Where I think you guys have planted like a million trees already, and you, your mission is to plant like eighteen billion. Is that why you chose fruit trees specifically? Like just because you feel like there's this they're really powerful in a lot of different ways. Yes, they're very powerful. And and the reason why we chose the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation is because we wanted to give something that was like food and medicine for millions of people. Eventually, we, we shifted it to fruit, nut, and medicinal trees. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I was talking to my friend that, you know, who's dealing with his health troubles here yesterday. And he's like, you know that they that they use pecan branches for spiritual healing. And I was like, never heard that before. Pecan branches. Now, pecans are huge in this area. It's one of the dominant trees in the area, and it's one of the great food trees in the world and of this whole region. And I never heard that pecan. Now it makes sense to me because pecans are it's it's all love. I mean, it's just there's nothing about a pecan tree that's troubling to anybody. It's just so easy to deal with it. It's just such a great tree. Uh, by the way, I do have a pine tree in, or a, sorry, a pecan tree in Ontario, Canada, that is an outlier. It is it is for sure the northernmost grown pecan tree in all of Ontario. There, it's, there's not another pecan tree within hundreds of miles. And it's just an outlier. It's just one that could survive the cold. It's a one in 20 that could make it. And this year it got, it, you know, got up at about 10 to 12 feet tall yes. after 10 years. Wow. <laughs> now, if it was in this ecosystem, that would already be a full on tree. It'd be 40 feet tall at this point. But you know, that winter, just the dieback and the killback and just it, its response and it just made it. It finally made it over our heads now. And it's like, whoa, it's going to make it all the way. <laughs> that, you know, that's magical right there. That's, you know, one of those special things you go, my God, you know, so that to me has always endeared me to pecans the last 10 years, at least, because I've been watching that thing, like survive the winter and come back. And it grows <laughs> a little bit more each year, just a little bit more and a little bit more. And finally, now it's 10, it's probably 12 feet tall with the <laughs> flat, with the leaves and everything. Pretty soon we're going to have um, nuts off of it. That's nice. awesome. Yeah. Little babies all grows up. Yeah. We planted so. a pecan tree last year on this property, uh, again, on Vancouver Island. And we tend to have much longer and faster growth season just because of the temperatures. So we'll see how this baby, how this yeah, we've baby got grows. a few different ones. We, we planted when we don't do well. I don't, the, the pecan trees are amazingly <laughs> tough. Uh, okay. So epic. Cool. And they survive. Like you can have pecan trees here. We're in the Houston area, which is a swamp. No problem. You can have them grow growing in West Texas, which is a desert. No problem. Ah, nice. It's it's really rewarding planting your own trees. So when we moved out here, we planted, we probably got about 15 trees, fruit trees that we planted around here, nut and fruit trees. Um, hardest one though to keep from getting destroyed every year is the cherry trees. I find like the bugs just eat those Devour. poor things alive every year. And I'm not too sure what to do because you know, don't spray any of the trees or anything like that, but figuring out some solutions for that, we'll have to see what we can come up with. There's, there's, you know, what I do is I make the biodynamic teas. So things like yarrow, dandelion, chicory, weeds in the yard, plus horsetail. Yeah. And then if you can add to that, um, some, you get some neem leaf sent to you from a tropical location somewhere. So I basically make a little biodynamic tea, even with mushrooms in it, it can have reishi and chaga in it. And then, then I'll add horsetail and then maybe some neem leaf. And then I'll go around and I'll spray that on everything. 
just with a little, those little, little ch -ch -ch and just ch -ch yeah, yeah, yeah. Things they use to spray, you know, all the chemicals. Yeah, and yeah. I use it to spray tea, and uh, that does some remarkable things. Cool. Oh, that'll be fun. We'll we'll experiment with that. I'll let you know how that goes. Um, David, what are your thoughts around water? You had mentioned water earlier. I I feel like there's been a lot of conversation around water in different ways too. A lot of information around how important water is as far as even like a transmitter of information i mean it literally can carry frequencies within water clusters in water um you know the structured water versus regular tap water that people are drinking what are your thoughts around that as far as for people getting high quality water what's what's kind of the best way for people to do it um, as far as what they might be able to do First thing I want to give you is a resource that everybody should explore find a spring.com findaspring.com had a lot of work in that field for over 25 years and I've been in many different places all around the world many different continents around the world hunting spring water so that's been a passion and a love of mine for forever cool. and that's a great resource findaspring.com because that's free water in your ecosystem infinite amounts and it's real and it's bacteria free because when the water comes out of the earth, it's free of all contaminants. And that's a really cool thing that you can get like, wow, real water. Now, if you want to store it for a long period of time, let's say you only can only get there once a month. Then you put a couple drops of coated silver or a couple drops of iodine in your big five gallon jug of water, get it out of direct light, put it in a, in a cool place, and it will last easily for a month. Um, a friend of mine has a really cool strategy. She likes those one gallon containers with the little eye hole, you know, the, the handle. So we, we had those when we were kids for like apple juice, you know, this big gallon right. apple juice in class. She gets four of those and you can buy those in fours and then you can fill those up with spring water and then you can just shove a refrigerator full of them. So if you're going to keep like, for example, spring water around and you want it perfect and you don't want to add anything to it, you could just get an extra refrigerator, get it off the internet for a hundred bucks and fill it up with those one gallon jars. And that's a really cool way to do it as well. Awesome. I'm, it's so funny. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because we've kind of been on the lookout for natural spring water uh, sources. And as I just pulled up the site, folks, it's uh, throughout the world. So check out that site, not just in the States, but throughout the world. Yeah, it's we found a spring just near where we were. So we would go down and fill up the jugs. We actually did a little video on the adventuresenjoy.org platform where of us actually collecting the water and then we'd bring it back <clears throat> and that was the water that we were using for drinking and I, I tell you like when you do get to actually drink like spring water it's so satiating it, <laughs> it, it's hard to describe it it really is just a different sensation i mean one of the first times i really did that we did a a three-day hike up through the rockies in in yoho national park years back and you're going and i mean there's this massive river running through there and, and you're you know we're collecting that even you might like do like a charcoal pump on it or something like that if you needed to but it's like you're drinking that water and it just it tastes different you almost can't drink enough of it like you kind of feel like you just keep taking it and it does feel like you are i mean it's a structured water because it's it's naturally moving and it's in sunlight and stuff like that too so you get all these different health benefits from that too but it, it feels like you're being informed in a different way. It, it really does. Or lit up in a different way. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, and it just, it's just a different experience. So if you haven't had a chance to see if you can find it and, and give that a try. That's my favorite for sure is wild spring water. And everywhere around the world, it's just such a pleasure to get to those springs. Like there's a place, I'm just, it's, I think it's called Onkelvatn that's in Iceland where it's carbonated coming out of the ground that's fun oh my god is that the best ever that is just it's just something else and you know you can just imagine just all the variety of the springs across the world and just the magic of the whole thing very very magical experience now beyond that let's say you're like okay what do i do about my house you definitely want a whole house system that filters for your whole house and then i would even add extra so like for example this house isn't on a spring this house is on the community water which comes from the earth it comes from a reservoir in the earth Texas has huge, enormous volumes of water under the ground between 50 and 5,000 feet down. The oil is generally 7,500, even 10,000 feet down, and then all the way even down to 35,000 feet. And then my guess is if you're going to get to the primary water, which is underneath that, that's somewhere around 50,000 feet. So the big, just for everyone's knowledge about this, the big oil repositories in West Texas 
and also to in East New Mexico are between 22,000 and 28,000 feet down. And those oil deposits are enough to completely run the United States for hundreds of years. Just so we're not confused about all this, like we're running out of oil or just, it, it's all a scam. It's a massive scam. There's no scarcity of oil. There's no scarcity of water. There's no scarcity of food. There's no scarcity of anything. All that's created by psychopaths who, who just feel like scarcity is their way of selling or their way of staying in control or, you know, their control freak behavior is driven by their scarcity mentality, something like that's going on. But just to give us an idea, Texas could easily run the whole United States, just that oil field, just the West Texas oil field, not the oil fields here in East Texas, just that one in the West Texas could run the whole United States for hundreds of years. Hmm. It's so, it's so cuckoo. I mean, it just, I, you know, I just don't know what to say about it. And then even when that's drained out, they'll likely refill up because the petroleum based rock or the petroleum source rock or what they call the source rock will flow back in there and fill it all back up again. You know, wow. that's just where we're at. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's, that's mind this, I have this place like basically triple filtered. So we have one on the whole house and then at every, uh, every shower, there's another filter. And then at the sink, there's even a third filter. So, you know, we just, you know, you want those many different layers just in case, but what we, what we have here, we don't have municipal water that's recycled and put back into the water supply. That's terrible. You always want source water as best you can get it, well water or spring water directly into your home. And then that goes into the environment as gray water. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Tricky ones sometimes to do, but that's a great resource. Check that out. Findaspring.com and see if you can find one near you. Um, at least even if you can't get it for everything, at least you can maybe get it for your own drinking water. Right, exactly. So, and and it's free. It's that's the thing. And when you're there too, by the way, that's a great chance to hunt wild herbs and mushrooms. It's super fun. You'll find all kinds of interesting things growing near the spring. Yeah. Cool, um, David. I was wondering if you could speak from your perspective um, a little bit more about screens, TVs, television. We touched on it, and I wanted to dive a little bit more into that for people who are new and even getting a little. Mm, having second thoughts about exposing themselves, their children to screen time. Can you speak a little bit more from your perspective and how screens are even created? What sort of technology might even be incorporated within them to keep us hooked into watching this television, which in my mind, it's a it's the vision of somebody else that we are opting in and creating for them without our full consent or knowledge. Okay, well, I will say this. First thing about screens is watch the blue light. I dial all the blue light down on all my screens. You can do that on your phones. You can do that on your uh, your tablets and your desktops. You can use uh, software like Flux, F dot L-U-X. You can download that and have that as a blue blocker on your screen within a minute from right now. F dot L-U-X, download that software and boom, you can you can lower that light down. I also do lower the light at night and my phone automatically does it just so that I'm not getting super bright light at night. So I've, I've taken the blue light out. So I'm going warm light plus I'm lowering the amount of light. So I'm just not getting blasted with all that light close to my face. I do try to keep the screens also far away from me as best as I can. Generally, as a general rule, the further you are away from your devices, the safer you are and it's the square of the distance. So the further you are away, the EMF, the electromagnetic fields and that, um, harsh light diminishes rapidly. So that's important to know. So if you're going to watch a movie or something, be far away from the screen. Now, I, I can just tell you, I'm an amateur in terms of my research in hypnosis and television. I can tell you many ways that television is weaponized. The most obvious is the flicker rates and the flicker frequencies. So they found out long ago that it, that certain people will be hypnotized by certain flicker rates. And it, you, you have certain tolerance to flicker rates. So some people have a high tolerance to flicker rates and they're less hypnotizable. Other people have no tolerance and they just get immediately sucked in and hypnotized. Where does everyone stand on this? Well, we all stand somewhere in that zone. So just because someone says, well, I can't be hypnotized doesn't mean that they can re res resist flicker rates. So they have that thing flickering at you at a certain frequency. And if you're hypnotizable, you get pulled right in. And you, next thing you know, you'll be watching CNN or some other some other abomination or, or movies. And for sure, all of the Disney films are weaponized like this. All of Hall, anything coming out of Hollywood's all weaponized in that way. They, they're using flicker rates. They're using subliminal programming. They're flashing things very quickly in front of you. 
all of that all at once. And that if I really went into my own knowledge on it, I'd say there's probably five ways that I can think of that they've weaponized it. The real story, though, is about 15 ways. Mm. So generally, I know that I'm not capable of resisting all of that hypnosis. So I just don't watch it. I just don't do it. I spend my time. If I'm going to watch something, it's going to be documentaries. I'm going to be something that's educational, but I don't do Hollyweird. Um, I do know that there are people in Hollywood who are, there's another side of Hollywood, which is Hollywood. There are people, really amazing, incredible people, awesome capabilities in many different departments. And you have both those competing with each other, by the way, Hollywood and Hollywood and generally Hollywood's winning, but maybe not forever. You know, hopefully we'll get better content out of there soon. At any rate, the, the best thing to do is to, at some point, just say, turn it off and turn your screens off and read a book and turn your internet off and read a book or turn your internet off and go out in nature mm -hmm. and get some real natural frequencies. So I, we try to get that in every day, at least one hour in nature every day. Today, I'll be out watering the plants. Today, I'm going to be out um, going for a walk. Today, today, I'll be out just doing a little yard chores and stuff like that. And that's just my time that I've just set aside. That's away from screens. Mm -hmm. I don't bring my phone with me either. People are like, well, what if you see something? And I do see things that are really cool. And I wish I had my phone there, but I don't have it there because I don't want my screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. you know, the flicker frequency was an interesting one because you, if you're sitting there watching it, you're not noticing it, but where you do notice it is like when we were in Mexico for a while, it's like we were in, right downtown sort of areas, people all over the place. You, you know, you look across the street and there's, there's another whole big complex there. And, you know, you can see everybody's doing everything on the other side. You'd see when the TV was on mm -hmm. and it really was like this. Like, I remember watching thinking like, is that a strobe light or something? Like what's going on? But it was just a TV. But, but when you're not right in front of it and you're seeing it from a distance, you actually see the the oscillations that are taking place and and you know from afar i'm looking I'm like gosh that would drive me crazy but you don't really realize when you're right in front of it that that actually is what's going on um whatever degree that that sort of has an effect on it but it's just funny to see it when you when you sort of separate yourself and give a little distance to it the perception of it is very different so I, I remember that was the first time i think i watched that i really did think someone had a strobe light they were doing like a but no it was just a tv going on and off and and you see how much this flickering is taking place um, David, I want to be respectful of your time. I know we're just about finished up here. One last thing I'd like to ask before we um, finish up is you've talked before about activating people's own genius. Um, and I think that's so important because otherwise I think we look for quote unquote, what we think is genius outside of ourselves. So I think that's what probably one of the best things we can do as far as a return to mastering our own life is, is activating our own genius. What, what do you mean by that? And what are maybe some beginning steps that people could start, you know, daily steps that they could start on the path to awakening that more. One of my favorite philosophers, Walter Russell, his statement was genius is self-bestowed. Mediocrity is self-inflicted. Mm -hmm. If you get into what you're really into, if you really dive into it, go all the way into it. Let's say you're really into plants. I'm really into plants. I go all the way into it. I'm no holds barred. I'm going all the way to the bottom of the barrel. I want to, I'm, I'm scraping at the bottom of the barrel. I want everything that's out there on that subject because I'll keep going. And that's, that, that to me is genius. If you just keep going into what you're into. Um, I really like the Bigfoot phenomenon. I'm really into it. This is my little Bigfoot sticker. <laughs> I, you gotta, you I go all yourself. the way. I've talked to the top Bigfoot researchers in the world. I'm personal friends with them. Why would I be personal friends with them? I'm, that's not my business. My business is food. But, but I love it. I'm absolutely enthralled with it. it I, I want to know. I want to know the truth. And so that's genius, right? Because I'll, I'm willing to push everything out of the way to get to the bottom of it. That, that ultimately is where you've got to go with whatever your personal interest is. If your personal interest, for example, is putting together manuals for fixing cars, you need to go all the way into that to the maximum, create books, put it out on the internet, just go a totally berserk in that area because that's your love and your passion. That's genius. Mediocrity, it's self-inflicted because it's a thing of like, well, I don't have time. Oh, you know, I've got to do this instead. Oh, uh, you know, it's like if you love something, you'll find the time. You'll break barriers to get to more hours with that subject matter. 
and you'll get there. You'll figure out a way. So genius will find a way. And we're more and more and more moving away from entertainment and all this distraction towards the frequency of genius. This is a, a, a trend. It's a positive trend that's occurring in our whole civilization. And it will lead to really cool breakthroughs in the future because it makes like if I'm like the best thing I can do for you is become better myself. The best thing you guys can do for me is become better yourself. You guys become better than you. You you take care of home and so many problems for me because I can go to your thing and be like, they did a whole deep dive on this particular subject. I can find out what they did and I can get all that. And that's better for me. You see what I'm saying? And and this ultimately is the way that we heal the world. It's We just go so deep in what we're doing that we become a light for that subject matter in the world. I, I love that, David. I think that's actually the perfect place to finish this off with. You know, it, it reminds me a little bit of our, our friend RJ Spina was talking about constantly stay in the act of creation, right? It keeps you in, kind of probably keeps you in that flow state um, where you're talking about genius will always find a way and to go right all in. I, I love it. And I know for myself, when I'm feeling most inspired, it's when I'm in that place. And I think really it's no accident that so many of the population has been, you know, um, hurting from depression, anxiety. I feel like it's because we've we've gone astray. We've stepped away from what really matters to us on a soul level. And as we come more and more alignment into what exactly you're speaking of, it's it also has this natural effect of you know, pivoting from the service to self, only thinking of this body, this self, this house, this community, this family, to then naturally going into service to others. Like we actually are overflowing with all the excitement that we're coming across that we just want to share it with everybody around us. Well, and it's not even, a, it doesn't even have to be a conscious thought. I think the thing is like, when you connect to your own genius, that isn't the highest good for yourself, for everybody. So it's for like everybody. you don't even have to have the thought of like, I got to do this for mm -hmm. everybody. That is a, that's a natural consequence of acting from that place. So we just got to connect to it and then actually make it a priority to actually live by it. Well said, it, it, it's automatic. It's like understanding your environment or interacting with your environment. Once you get rid of all the program, it's just automatic. It's automatically there. And it leads, it's so cool too. It's just constantly a thrill. I'm constantly excited about like, I wonder what's on this next page. I wonder what's coming up next. I wonder what could be, you know, right, right on this other side of this next chapter. Mm -hmm. There's so much of that out there. It's just incredible. And then to put also to take the stuff you're, you're learning and to put it into action. Absolutely awesome. Yeah. Uh, David, that was, that was great. You're uh, such a, a breath of enthusiasm. Yeah. So I, I really love it. It's contagious. So yeah. I, I love the work you're doing. Where can people learn more about the platforms that you've got? Where can people learn more about the work that you've got coming up? Right on. Thank you. You can always find me at FrequencyLifestyle.org. FrequencyLifestyle.org. And we're going to have a whole bunch of videos on that site very soon, which I'm really excited about, like one minute videos. So there'll be a lot of cool, like, you know, candy there. Like, okay, let me just get the quick download a minute here, two minutes there, that kind of thing. And we've been working on that for some time. So that's fun. And then you can always track me through um, the social media site. So on Telegram, I'm David Avocado Wolf on Telegram, t.me slash David Avocado Wolf, or on Instagram, on um, David, just David Avocado Wolf. Twitter, actually, I've been on Twitter. I'm having so much fun on Twitter. What an abomination that platform is. But I'm <laughs> so much fun. I can't help it, um, which is just David Wolf, W O L F E, on Twitter. <laughs> awesome thanks so much david we will have thank all those you, thank in the you both. yeah what a okay, big love to you both of you and your kids thanks so much thank you.